Well, I think we're good with announcements. Um, and so we're going to kick off this evening with an awesome keynote. We have uh, Lily Guo from Docker, and we're going to we're gonna switch around our computers and we're gonna be talking more about Docker and some security stuff. Absolutely, uh, this, is being, uh, this is being recorded, streamed, recorded? This, this is being recorded, recorded. Uh, and we'll have, uh, we'll have the recordings online um, in probably like sometime next week. Um, and I, I think like one of the interesting things, and I don't know if Boyd knew this or not, but we're, we're gonna talk like some security stuff today, we're gonna talk about some security stuff tomorrow. Uh, I know it's been one of the like questions about containers in general, so um, you know I think it'll be uh, kind of good to talk about that stuff and then you know go into more in an open space format later in the afternoon. Definitely, and uh, just the this is being recorded with motion activated cameras, so those of you that might have an inclination to stand up and flail around, and specifically I'm talking to Boyd, please uh, please refrain for the duration of the uh, of the keynote. Thank uh, you. And uh, with that, we hand it over to Lily Guo. Woo! Um, all right, cool. Thank you, guys. Is my mic working? Is it, nope. It's definitely on. Anyone can. Is that better? I can't put it that close to my face. How about now? All right, that's good. Cool. So good, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone had a good first day at Container Days. My name is Lily. I'm a software developer at Docker. So I was approached for this talk pretty late. And so when I was sort of brainstorming topics for this talk, I was kind of looking at the event and the technical audience here. And I feel like I don't really need to explain containers or like try to sell benefits of containerization. So instead, I'm going to spend some time to talk about securing the software supply chain and how Docker can help you with that. So before we start, let me explain what I mean by software supply chain. I'm talking about the process of building, shipping, and running containers. So at Docker, it's been our goal for a long time to support the full workflow of containerizing software. So process of build, ship, run. And if any of you have had any interactions with us, this is, these words aren't new. They're probably really old. We put them literally everywhere. This is our homepage. It's all over our company walls. It's like becoming gibberish to me by now. But when we say build, ship, run, we're really talking about the entire workflow of software. So everything from you know, the first time you start composing your application, you know, building some kind of container, to easily distributing it, and finally to de deploying it where you want. So today, I want to talk specifically about security in terms of build, ship, run. So, I assume everyone here already knows that running your software in a container gives you security benefits. Your software is isolated, it's less likely to be affected by the environment, it's harder to attack. So containerization in some ways already offers security benefits for the run part of what I'm talking about. And I know someone had talked about Docker Swarm today as well. Docker Swarm already, um, <clears throat> also has a whole suite of security um, benefits. But what about everything leading up to deploying software? So what about build, ship? Uh, people often don't focus on securing these steps, but if you can't securely build software and you can't securely distribute it, then you're still vulnerable no matter how securely it's run, how much you're isolated. So let's start by talking about building an image. Let's say you're starting from scratch, first time, what's the first thing you need? You need a base image, something to build your application on top of. So here we have an example of a Docker file. This one is based on Golang. Other common base images are like Ubuntu, Debian, Alpine, images like that. So back in the day, your only option for base images was community content. So these were the public images that people pushed to Hub. And at the time, the community really did step up. And they gave us a lot of good content, gave users a lot of options. And that was really awesome. But it sort of led to a decision paralysis. At some point, there were so many, issues, so many images and so little information to differentiate them that users coming to Hub really had really little to go on on what to choose, what product to run, what to base their images off of. So if you're just coming in and looking for an OS image to use as a base, this whole process was really opaque. 
Like you just didn't know what was inside a lot of these images. So at that point, do you, do you need Debian? Do you need Ubuntu? If you're just starting out, it was a really overwhelming decision. So this was an issue even if you actually knew what you were looking for. So if you go to Hob and you search for Jenkins and you know all you want is a container that runs Jenkins, you still somehow end up with 4,581 community results. I don't even know what most of them do, to be honest. Like, how do you know which one is better? How do you know which one is secure? How do you know which, at some point, how do you know which one isn't a scam? So out of these problems came our official images program. Uh, official images are the images under the library namespace. So these are the images you can do a Docker pull on without a prefix, without a namespace. So if you do like Docker pull Alpine, that's an official image. These images are sort of considered first class images. So maintainers of these images worked with us in a collaboration. We built them together. They had to adhere to a set of standards before they were accepted as official images. So we at Docker were, um, we at Docker are trying to tell our users, if you don't really know what you're looking for, try these, we trust them, we think these images are good. So as we worked on official images, one of the things we wanted to be able to say is that these images are secure. But that sort of raises the question of who gets to decide what's secure. Different people and different projects and different companies have really different security needs. There are some individuals who might not care about a couple of vulnerabilities here and there. You might not really care for your own personal project you know, if the OS you're based on has some kind of obscure floppy disk vulnerability. <laughs> this is a real case. Um, at the same time, there are large corporations who might not be able to handle any risk at all. So how do we make this decision to say whether or not an image is secure enough to be official? We don't want to require that every single image needs to be 100% clean and void of any possible vulnerabilities ever. If we did, we would essentially be excluding a ton of content that is really useful to a lot of people. And at the same time, we didn't want to just like stamp secure on images knowing that there might still be a small risk. So coming out from that whole discussion and a lot of meetings, we ended up deciding to let consumers make that decision for themselves. So instead of gathering data and then having us sit in a room and decide, we tried to make this process a little bit more transparent. So we would gather the security data and give the public access to it so people can decide for themselves. And this brings us to Docker security scanning. Um, the project internally was called Nautilus. So I apologize if I switch back and forth between those two names. I worked on it and it was hard, sort of switched to a much more mundane name after Nautilus. Um, so this project was started last year. It was launched around May. And Docker security scanning is a tool that provides you with a really detailed view of an image. So it shows you all the packages and all the vulnerabilities in an image divided by layer. In the back end, what we're doing is a binary scan of an image layer by layer, open it up every single layer, and that gives us a bill of material of everything in the image. And then at that point, we compare this information to publicly known vulnerabilities and give you a list of essentially all the vulnerabilities in your image. Um, a big part of displaying this data was how to visualize it, because uh, honestly, a list of vulnerabilities are really useless. So I actually really like how our designers decided to visualize it. So instead of me trying to paint you a little mental picture, I'm just going to go to our Nautilus scan. There we go. So here we have MySQL, which is an official repository on Hub. And here you can see that on the tags tab, you get a list of all the scanned, uh, all the scanned tags. And at this point, you can also see a summary. Mouse is on the other side there. Uh, you can see a security summary. I don't know if the colors are showing up right, but essentially this bar is a security summary of the components in your image. So red stands for critical, red stands for components that might have critical <coughs> vulnerabilities, orange is for major, yellow is for minor, but I don't actually think there's any yellow here. And green are components that don't have any known vulnerabilities. 
So at this point, if you're looking for a MySQL container and you don't really know what version to go for, this is usually a good place to start. This is available for all the official images. And you can just play around, look at the vulnerabilities, and see what you're OK with. So if you want to dig a little deeper, the Wi-Fi works. Um, you can go into a specific version. And here you have secu uh, detailed security data broken down layer by layer. So each layer is represented here, and it's tied to the line in the Docker file that actually creates the layer. So you can see some layers bring in a lot of components, like this base layer, which I believe is Debian. I'm pretty sure MySQL is based off of Debian. And then you get you know, these layers that also bring in some stuff. They're usually, I think, app get something. And then you have a bunch of layers that don't bring in anything because they're just exporting environment variables. Um, so each one of these little boxes is actually, it's hard to do this with my current return. Each one of these boxes are components that are in your image. So you can click into any one of them and see a little bit more. You can get the name, license information, if that's important, as well as any vulnerabilities that are inside. So you can learn about the vulnerabilities in an image and use that to decide, you know, are you okay with this vulnerability? Is this something you're comfortable with? Um, this is also really important for maintainers of official images because they can use this information to find the vulnerabilities they have, pinpoint which component they're in, and then see what they can do about it. So we've worked with a bunch of maintainers who have updated older packages to new ones that no longer have vulnerabilities. And I know some people have actually switched from, uh, switched from base images that are vulnerable to newer base images. So for example, older versions of Debian had a lot of problems and the newer ones are, I think, almost entirely clean after working with us. And some people have switched also to Alpine, which, as you can see from our scan, is really compact, really small. So if someone do doesn't need that much from their base image, this has been really helpful. Alpine doesn't have any critical vulnerabilities. It currently does have a major one, but we are working on it with the people that are maintaining it. Going back to the presentation. These are just some slides in case the Wi-Fi fails on me. There we go. Are you um, taking questions during this talk? Uh, probably not. But is that? I don't know. What do you guys think is the event? OK, we'll do questions at the end. Um, so Docker security scanning, I believe, brings a lot of transparency to the process of choosing an image. So as a consumer, you can get a detailed view of any official image and then decide for yourself if that's something you're comfortable running. Another benefit from this transparency that we don't always talk about is that it really encourages continuous improvements of images. So by putting this data out there in the public and drawing attention to possible vulnerabilities, maintainers are actively encouraged by us or by the community to put resources into improving images. And like, that's a lot of nice words, but really what I'm saying is that it's kind of public shaming. If no one knows about an issue, no one really does anything about it. I like this a lot. So by making our information public and easy to understand, we were able to convince a lot of maintainers to work with us. And the number of security vulnerabilities in the, image, in the official images has really decreased in the last year. So I, earlier, I mentioned Debian as well as Alpine. It's actually a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of maintainers have worked with us. So until now, I've sort of talked about how security data benefits you as a consumer. So if you're trying to, pick a, uh, trying to pick an image, you get a lot more information. But what if you're building content yourself? So having a detailed view of your own images is also really important. So our security scanning pro can provide information on all the vulnerabilities in your image as well as where they're located. So using this data, you can find components. Uh, you can find the components that are bringing the vulnerability and try to replace them. We'll also let you know, um, I didn't show it earlier, but if anything is coming in in a base layer, we specifically mark it so that you don't have to dig through your own stuff and try to find it. And you know that you'll need to either contact the maintainer of the base image or switch base images to fix that. Um, so when users scan their content, we can also help them visualize sort of a bomb of everything in their image. This can be used to identify unnecessary, image, uh, unnecessary packages that you have and reduce bulk. It also has licensing information, so you can, if that's important, you can make sure you're not using anything that's off limits. 
So let's say you've really made an effort, you've cleaned up all of your images. That's kind of not the end. New vulnerabilities are being discovered every day. Uh, and Docker security scanning also continuously monitors images and will alert people on new issues. So if something's wrong, the maintainer will be the first to know and they can fix the issue as soon as possible and reduce the amount of time that it's vulnerable. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, Docker security scanning is a fairly new project. Um, currently, all it really does is provide a visualization of all the data within an image. But in the future, we're hoping that it can have a more active role in helping people with their content. So as we scan more images and we get more data, we're hoping that um, with this data, we can analyze it and try to make active suggestions to users. So something that I'm really excited about is that I'm hoping someday we can say, hey, you're using version X of Debian and it has a critical vulnerability. A lot of people building similar things are using version Y. It's a lot cleaner. Would you like to give that a shot? Another thing we're trying to work at is being able to tell when issues are fixed. So I'm going to use Heartbleed as an example. Uh, it would be great if using our scanning data, we could figure out that a new version of OpenSSL has been scanned. It no longer has the vulnerability. Let's notify our users to update their packages. This way, our users don't have to be monitoring and keeping track of the status of a vulnerability themselves. So, so far, we've discussed the benefits of securing the build portion of build, ship, run. So what about shipping? The process of distributing software to your machines. How do you really know that your software is being shipped securely? Um, you could build the most secure software in the world. It wouldn't matter if you got man in the middle at some point and someone tricked you into running something else. So in other words, how do you know that what you're running on your machines or on AWS is actually what you want? What does the machine need to trust the piece of software that it receives? So to answer that, let's think of security a little bit differently. So a computer is really just a general purpose machine that executes a bunch of orders in the form of software. So we can think of it also as, say, a person, maybe a soldier, that is executing orders from higher ups. So let's imagine we have a soldier. Soldier gets orders. You follow them. Everything is good. But you wouldn't necessarily obey any random order from a random person on the street. They could be actively trying to trick you into doing something stupid. So it's important that you can guarantee that your orders come from someone, not necessarily one specific person, but someone within your chain of command, from someone that you can trust. So in software security, that idea that you can trust where your software is coming from is known as authenticity. Now, even if you trust the person who gave the orders, you wouldn't want to follow them if you knew they were tampered with en route. So you want another guarantee that the orders you received have been unchanged from the time they were made to the time they were delivered. So this is kind of referred to as data integrity. Finally, you don't want to execute any orders if they're out of date. They may no longer be relevant, and in some cases that's harmless, but in some cases that could also be actively harmful. You need a timestamp or an expiration date after which orders should not be executed. So what you need is a freshness guarantee. So as a soldier, you want to follow relevant, accurate, and trustworthy orders. And you also want your machine to run relevant and accurate and trustworthy software. So in the context of Docker, that means that when you do a Docker pull, we want to be able to guarantee that uh, we want to be able to guarantee the authenticity, and integrity, and freshness of the software or the orders that you've received. So at this point, a lot of people will say, this problem's already been solved. We have GPG signatures. Just sign everything. It'll be fine. So let's take a look at that claim a little bit more. GPG signatures can tell us that a specific person signed a series of bytes, and those bytes haven't changed. So that is somewhat true. GPG signatures do provide us with stronger authenticity and stronger integrity guarantees. But what we need to remember is that digital signatures are just a cryptographic primitive, a building block. They provide authenticity and integrity without really any surrounding context. So after you verify a signature, you know that someone signed these blocks, uh, signed these blobs at some point for some reason. But you don't know why they signed them. You don't really know when they signed them. Sometimes you don't even know if they should have been able to sign for them in the first place. So this still leaves us vulnerable to a lot of attacks. An example would be that uh, GPG alone does not protect against replay attacks. So a replay attack is a form of network attack 
where perfectly valid good bytes are maliciously repeated. So just realized I've combined two talks for this, and I think realizing that I make fun of OpenSSL on both of them. I'm just going to be vaguer. Think of an older version of some package that has a well-known vulnerability. It was valid at some point, but you definitely don't want it anymore. So today, an attacker could serve you with this version of this package when you request an update. And this outdated package is still a real signed package. So when you get it, the GPG signatures will check out, and you'll have no idea anything is wrong. So even with GPG signatures, an attacker can actually trick you into installing an old version of some software, indefinitely starve you of updates, and then eventually take advantage of your vulnerability. So ultimately, secure software distribution is a tough problem, one that a cryptographic primitive building block like GPG just can't solve on its own. What we actually need is a full signing framework to guarantee authenticity and integrity and freshness. And to achieve that, we've built something at Docker called Docker Content Trust, which is based on the update framework, or TUF. A little bit of background about TUF. TUF originates from the Tor project. So it is based on the update system for Tor, which was able to withstand attacks from black hats and security researchers and even nation states. So TUF uses signing to secure software distribution, but it's a lot more than just a digital signature. It's a full signing framework. It specifically authorizes people or, and their keys to sign for certain packages. So it gives us really good fine-grained authenticity. Any package that is described by Tuff is specified as a mapping from a human-readable name to a hash. So after we download a package, we can calculate its hash and we can verify its contents. This gives us the integrity guarantee I was talking about earlier. If the package you downloaded has been tampered with at some point, the hash should be different, so when you try to verify it against tough metadata, you'll know something is wrong. Finally, Tuff has a concept of uh, timestamp metadata. So this timestamp points to a set of data that is currently valid, and it expires very quickly. Um, here I put 24 hours. I think this is something you can set yourself, but generally saying the faster is the better. So by expiring this data, we are guaranteeing freshness. By enforcing this frequent re-signing every 24 hours or every week or something of the latest timestamp, Tuff is making a distinction between decommissioned software and old but supported, uh, supported versions. So for example, we might want to support an older version of Ubuntu, even if it's pretty old as long as people are still using it. But then if there's a package that actually has a vulnerability, it should be expired. Um, after whatever amount of time the expiration is, and then afterwards, people will know it's out of date. So one other thing that makes Tuff really interesting is that it uses multiple keys instead of one root master key. So there are many different roles in Tuff, um, and each role has its own key. All of these keys are assigned by one trusted root, so there is still a root. Um, but because there are multiple keys, if one key is compromised, only some of the data is compromised, and it's really easy to recover from. With traditional signatures, you often, you often only have one key. So we would need to keep the master key online and sign it and use it frequently, probably share it with people. And you just need to think about all the risk factors there. Are. It really only just takes one idiot developer to send this key in plain text for it to be compromised. So with Tuff, we have a whole system of trusted keys. And because we no longer need to keep the root key online and we don't need to use it every day, we can keep it much safer, ideally, instead of being online and accessed. We want to keep it offline, maybe in a vault or something dramatic. And we would, and ideally, when we use it, we would, only, we would want to use it on some kind of signing hardware. So I'm not going to go into any more details on the technical spec on Tuff. It's fairly involved, and there's just not that much time. Um, but so for the rest of the talk, you kind of need to take my word on the fact that Tuff is fairly secure. Um, it gives us good authenticity and integrity and freshness guarantees. And if there are any security engineers in the audience, I know that's very uncomfortable for you. So th I have included links to both specs and tech talks at the end. So you can check those out. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about Tuff as a framework, we can look at some of the possible attacks that could happen. So what if a malicious actor has, has a privileged network position? So man in the middle. 
he or she could send you a different image than what you expected. But if you use Tuff, Tuff will give you the hash of the valid image. So when you get a bad image, you calculate the hash and you try to verify it. Verification will fail. Um, earlier, I also mentioned that GPG signatures alone do not protect us from replay attacks. So because a GPG signature can't detect if something is out of date, a package that was signed invalid at some point continues to be valid. Tuff, however, enforces expiration on every single piece of metadata and everything it ever signs. So let's say there's an old package, it was signed at some point. If it's no longer valid, it wouldn't have been re-signed, and you'll be able to detect that it's outdated. Finally, in many systems, everything is secure until the one key is compromised, at which point everything is compromised, you throw everything out, you re-establish trust entirely. But with Tuff, because, because trust is established over a whole system of keys, if one is compromised, things aren't good, but the damage is isolated and it's easy to recover from. And I'm not gonna go too deep into this, but Tuff actually allows you to delegate certain packages to be signed certain packages to be signed by certain people, so you can have a whole Merkle tree of trusted keys where one key compromise really only compromises the subtree and not the entire system. So I actually gave a more detailed tech talk on Tuff recently, last week, and one of the comments we got during the Q&A session is that with Tuff and all of its keys and expirations, it just seems too complicated. I think what he said was that if half the people in the world can't even do GPG correctly, how are we ever supposed to expect people to use a framework this complicated? Um, and to be honest, I totally agree with him. It would be completely insane for me to expect another person to do all of Tough by themselves. You'd have to maintain all these different keys, rotate them, constantly resign things that are expiring. And it would just, at this point, if you had to do it yourself, I'd be more worried about human error than like a really sophisticated attack that could break Tough. But with Docker, we actually try to take care of most of the complexity. So you do need to do a one-time setup with Notary for a repository you want set, uh, secured, where you need to create some keys. But after that, all you need to do is export this one variable, Docker Content Trust. And by enabling Docker Content Trust, every push you do will be signed by tough specifications. And every image you pull will be verified by its contents and its content hash. So instead of doing, going a little bit deeper, instead of doing a standard pull by tag, your Docker client will actually go to trusted tough data, get the hash of the correct expected image, and then do a pull by hash. And then once the image is pulled, the hash will be calculated again and then verified against the tough trust data. So this process guarantees that the image you've pulled is what you expect. And with that, I have a demo video. I decided not to do this live because I've had awkward situations where it took 10 minutes to pull Alpine with Wi-Fi. So, oh, it's not showing up here. This is just a standard pull. You're pulling Alpine latest, very normal. Now you can export Docker Content Trust and with that enable our implementation, implementation of Tuff. Now when you run the exact same thing, what the client in the background is doing is getting the hash of the correct of the correct image and then doing a pull by that hash. There. And then once it's pulled, it will actually calculate the, uh, calculate the hash of the image and verify it again. So, what, so that is how a pull would work in a normal case. So what about a push? We can tag the image we just pulled as our own image and then push that. So as part of this push, now we're not just pushing the image itself, but we're also calculating all of the um, trust data and pushing that as well. So at this point you're signing and pushing trust metadata. You're required to put in both the root key as well as your repository key. And now you have a signed image that's pushed. Highlighting the keys that were used and that it's signed.
course that's coming. Okay, so now we can pull the image we just pushed with the secure data. And it should be exactly the same as the Alpine image we just pulled, where we use the trust data to get the hash and then pull by that hash and then verify the image. Now what happens if you pull something that isn't secure, whether it's unsigned in our case or somehow tampered with? So because the remote trust data doesn't exist in this case, um, we just automatically fail the pull. And this would be the same if, say, the hash somehow didn't match the image. So Docker Content Trust will actually take care of signing the image on push, verifying the image on pull, and specifically failing if an image does, can't be trusted. So if there's one thing that I want everyone to have heard in this presentation, it's that security doesn't have to be that hard. So once you've done a one-time setup with Notary, you can turn on Docker Content Trust, and from that point, we'll take care of securing the software distribution for you. So I hope I was able to convince everyone that it's important to secure your entire software supply chain and that Docker can help you with that. So for building software, please check out Docker Security Scanning. It's available for all the official images on Hub right now, and it will be on store as well. And you can turn it on for your own private repos. And when it comes to shipping, I hope that next time you do a pull or a push, you'll try enabling Docker Content Trust and securing the shipping portion of your workflow. So if anyone wants to learn more, here are some links to documentations on scanning and on Docker Content Trust. And as promised earlier, for anyone interested in security in more detail, I have linked the specs to Tuff. It's a pretty interesting read. And below it, there's a technical talk given by one of my coworkers on Tuff. So if anyone has any questions. So when you were talking about the MySQL. Uh... So thank you for the talk. Um, when you were talking about MySQL, you showed nice security examples. Um, I went and looked at your Docker Hub for Node.js. Doesn't have any of that stuff. And of course, large parts of the internet depend upon that. So I guess my question is, how are you guys going to encourage people like the Node.js team to buy into this security model? Because I fully agree that this kind of stuff needs to be done. Right? We need to actually have audit trails of what, went, what actually went into that unit and that CVEs, et cetera, have been applied. Mm -hmm. So what is Docker doing to encourage these other participants to engage who clearly have not yet? Um, well, part of it is the official images program. We're trying to make it, most of our polls at this point are Docker official images. So we are trying to encourage people by saying, if you join the official images program, you will most likely get a lot more polls and a lot more usage. But at the same time, you have to go through this workflow. Um, that is, is really. The official image? Is this the one listed in that case, it should be, if you're logged in, it should actually show up. Hmm. Are you logged in to help? You do need to be logged in. That is something we're working on changing, but right now you need to be logged in. But this does apply for other things as well, other images that maybe aren't part of official images. We're really trying to encourage them to go through that. Um, we've also recently launched Docker Store, and we're trying to encourage people to say, if you want to either sell or put out things for free on our store, you also have to go through these steps once we get to that point. <laughs> That's amazing. So for those of us who live behind firewalls, is there a way that we can scan images locally using some of the same security tools, or do we have to roll that ourselves? That is something we are working on for Docker, um, like on-premise, uh, for our on-premise <laughs> solutions. We don't currently have it, but the team that has, the team that is working on Docker security scanning is currently working on adding that. Thanks. Currently, you can't run it yourself. Currently, you have to load image. Yeah, load image. It could be a private image, so you're not necessarily exposing the data, but you do have to go all the way to Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. I was just asking when would that be available, I guess. So and she answered soon. It's coming. 
So I stand corrected. There's been a lot of cool stuff that's happened with security in Docker in the last year. Were you paying attention? <laughs> I do have a, a, so in all seriousness, when you were talking about GPG keys, um, I either missed something or it seems like there was a bit of a hand wave with authenticity um, because the GPG key only guarantees the integrity. It doesn't tell you who has that private key. So did I, did I miss something about how you're establishing the identity of the, of the entity holding the private key? Um, I think I actually corrected myself halfway through. It doesn't actually, um, yeah, it's basically saying that someone signed this and it hasn't changed. So unless you specifically know that someone, it doesn't really guarantee authenticity. Thanks. Uh, when the security scanning is available, can the subscriber to upload the uh, uh, images daily to get a real-time result, or? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, so every time, if, it's, if you're using it locally, you will have to rescan it every time you want new results. Um, if you're using it through Hub, which is currently available for private repositories, on every push where there's a change, we will rescan it. Um. So one question I had was, um, I know that you can do Docker security scanning for, um, you know, um, public images, and then you can do it for private images. But what about just like uh, a random Hello World image that I might have that's a that's still a public image, but not like a, a official repo? Um, well, so actually, currently you can't scan all public images. You can scan official repos. I'm sorry. Yeah. And private images. That's something we're still trying to work out. Um, if you have a random image and you upload it to your own, or you push it to your own account as a private image, you can scan that. Cool, thanks. That's something where not necessarily everyone wants that data to be available. Just because you have a public image doesn't mean you want everyone to be able to see everything in it. So we're trying to figure out where the line is there of who can show what. Any other questions? Oh. Going once, going twice, or we're going to a happy hour. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Lily. <laughs>